All right, I suppose it's 3 o'clock. We'll get started. My name is Christian Astrike. Um, I'm a software developer in town. I work for a company called uh, Boost and Brands. For those of you that are familiar with us, probably not. We are a, a whole conglomerate of brands, our biggest one being Fingerhut. Uh, everybody know Fingerhut.com? No? Okay. So we own Fingerhut and 16 other brands. Um, and that presents a unique challenge for us. Uh, and we've kind of migrated and moved towards uh, more message-driven patterns in our, our architecture, um, particularly around the fact that we now have acquired a company as of a year ago that had 12 brands, and we have we had four brands. So we have to bring these systems together, build a new platform to like unify all these things, but yet deliver the best possible experience we can to the customer. Um, and we're trying to move to things that are non-interrupted to the customer. Uh, my last talk was on uh, using some things to monitor, and Hysterix is one of those tools, and I'll talk a little bit about Hysterix in this particular uh, presentation, but ultimately we, we want to move to more message-driven architecture because we can be asynchronous in our approach. We can react faster. Uh, for example, when we make a payment or submit an order, we don't have to wait for a confirmation number when submitting an order. So like for us in e-commerce, that's a, that's a big deal to be able to submit orders through as fast as possible and have some number of systems respond and react to that order creation. Um, so we've started to adopt more and more this uh, message-driven pattern. Obviously, we're not 100% into this architecture yet, but we're migrating. Um, we want to get all of our payments to be asynchronous, our orders to be asynchronous, um, emails that go out to customers that generate from the web, we want those to be asynchronous. We want all these things to be Message driven, uh, and we, we are currently, uh, in, in full disclosure, we're using Kafka. Uh, my talk is going to focus on Kafka and Rabbit because, you know, pick your poison, I guess, when it comes to doing like a, a topic or a, a event based system. Um, I'll talk about why we picked Kafka a little bit. Uh, I, it's not to belittle Rabbit at all or any other kind of like topic or uh, queue system at all. It's just we picked Kafka because it's kind of the, Du jour, right? So technology du jour. So it's it's been working really great and it's scalable, highly scalable for us. But um, we have a lot of teams across the organization using Kafka in general. So that's kind of a little bit of a history of kind of how I got into doing message-driven architecture, event-driven architecture. Um, anybody here doing this type of pattern today? At all? Anywhere? No? One one short hand back there. Um, anybody use Kafka for any any particular things in their infrastructure today? All right, the one hand. All right, good. All right. Um, <laughs> anybody, anybody, not heard of Kafka or not familiar with that that technology? A couple people. Okay. Uh, so I'm I'm not gonna like give a whole primer on Kafka, but uh, basically, uh, high level, it's kind of a it's a technology that allows you uh, to do one. It's like it's it's basically a log, a di distributed log system, that works as both a topic and a, a event aggregator that just does timestamp based events. All right, sounds simple, but it was built to be highly distributed and highly uh, take a lot of throughput. Uh, I think the authors, I know they talk, so it's, it was a technology I think first put in place at uh, LinkedIn. So LinkedIn's entire or, uh, organization is driven with messages. So anything you do on their website, whether it's, you know, LinkedIn requests somebody or send a message is all done through uh, through a, some kind of event, some kind of message into the into Kafka. So everything is is done through the system, and it's allowed them to centralize all of their uh, their systems to instead of having to know the dependency chain of like I, I need to talk to A, B, and C, and C needs to talk to D, E, and F, and all this. Everybody can just listen to one thing and say like just just standard kind of queuing stuff. Like hey, I'm listening to a topic on on Kafka. When somebody puts an event in there, I'm going to react to the event. Right. That's Pretty simple in its approach, but it scales really well. Uh, Kafka is designed to be scalable, and you know, millions of requests a second through there are not uncommon. I know that uh, I attended QCon this year, uh, last November, and Uber talked about their implementation and usage of some of these technologies, and they're doing, you know, some of their data assets are coming through at well, 300 million an hour or some I, some crazy number that like I can't even fathom the system to that scale. But Kafka is a technology that can can bring your architecture to that scale. So in some ways, it's probably overkill for our thousands of orders a day. However, um, because it can scale so well, we can have a lot of systems on top of this message-driven platform that can allow us to do stuff. And 
certainly you, you can use Rabbit MQ, which is just another messaging system to do that same type of thing. But again, with Coffee, get some more stuff. But to talk a little bit about today. Uh, I'll show. I've, I've got a sample project that I'm going to send a link up to here in a second. You guys can download it. All the code I'm going to show is on my GitHub, my public GitHub repo, so you can download it, play with it, use it, whatever you want to do. Uh, hopefully, uh, because it's 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 Grails topical in the sense that it's done in Grails. However, if you're on a you're on any kind of Spring Boot or you know, pr probably in Rat Pack too as well, a lot of these topics or the, the the technologies, the patterns will still apply to you. So feel free to borrow the code all you want to do uh, any integrations with Rabbit or with uh, with Kafka that you need to do. So um, I'll cover a little bit about the Grails, uh, why I why I'm doing the stuff in Grails and why we're doing it in Grails. Some alternatives. Uh, we'll t Anybody familiar with the Reactive Manifesto? Anybody read that manifesto? Yeah, a couple people. Um, something that I've kind of tried to adopt in our team and kind of in my general practice approach to doing uh, development across our organization because uh, we'll talk about the tenets of what that really means and kind of how we can get there. Um, we'll talk about like what it means to be event driven because even when I was doing these presentations, these slides, you can Google it right now and there's like people like talk about the s semantics whether you're message driven or event driven and I, I found one good spot that kind of talked about the difference between the two. I guess somehow in my head they're the same thing. Like I'm just, there's some thing that happens and I want to do something based on the thing that happened, right? Whether that's an event or a message, I guess. I, I, to me it's very similar. I guess the, the nuances of how they describe a message versus an event in like the larger uh, technology community kind of makes sense. I think it's still a little vague to me, but we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then there's basically two approaches to doing event-driven systems and that is there's an event, uh, internal event-driven systems where you're just isolated in the scope of your own JVM and you're doing events inside, you know, whether it's uh, particularly I'll talk about Reactor and how you can do a Reactor event-driven system and the differences between doing like a singular application event system where you're doing stuff asynchronously inside of itself to respond to certain events that happen in the system or an external uh, system messaging, meaning that we have some sort of technology that sits in the middle of our, of our systems like Rabbit or like a Kafka that I talk about. And then we can just distribute the events and uh, have enterprise-wide responses to those events or reactions to those events. So there's kind of a different approach depending on what your particular technology needs are. Um, so this is the link to the to the GitHub project. If you just the Grails plugin consortium is a GitHub organization that I'm the solo. I'm the only consortium member. I'm a wolf pack of one, I guess, on that. So if anybody wants to join and add or contribute to the plugins that are in there. Currently, I, I, I own uh, JSQ. I'm the main contributor to the Redis plugin. Um, the CXF and CXF client plugins are the ones that I also own. Uh, a few other ones in there, too, that I've kind of um, adopted since the Grails 3 migration, since I raised my hand to do them, I guess. And I, they're like, you own them. And I was like, oh, yeah. um, so this, this, this sample application has a couple of different uh, things in there. And I'll, we'll, we'll actually get into code, and we'll look at it. but. There's two projects. There's a consumer and a producer that will do distributed eventing. Um, the producer actually does internal eventing as well. So there's examples of both internal eventing and external eventing in there. And then there is, uh, I added one that didn't make it the slide, but uh, Spring Boot has, or Spring Cloud has the Spr Spr Spring Streams library. Anybody familiar with Spring, the Streams library, the Cloud Stream stuff? Uh, it's it's Spring's opinionated approach to doing event-driven or message-driven uh, communication. And it's so opinionated, you, very, you have very little configuration to make a Rabbit or an MQ thing work. You basically just have to like use it, and it just works. So all the coding I did for these two things kind of becomes moot in a way if you use this, the cl uh, Spring Cloud Streams because it's, it, react, or it, it, it integrates very uh, easily with those two technologies. And I actually have an example project I last minute added that example project in there too. So if you want to <laughs> invest uh, some of your time into looking at uh, cloud streams, there's also a, a stream project in there as well. Uh, we'll talk about Kafka and the events uh, reactor. And then we'll touch on Zipkin. Anybody familiar with Zipkin, what that does in the back? So Zipkin is a, is a, uh, and Sleuth are, are uh, projects that allow you to track your distributed messages across requests because now in the microservice architecture, uh, or event-driven architecture. If we want to communicate and I fire an event off, uh, 
hey, I did something, and then somebody else says, oh, I want to I wanna do something with that thing, and they do something, and they fire an event that says, like, hey, by the way, I, I processed your order. Here's a confirmation number, so I have a confirmation number event, and then so the system can go, like, oh, cool. To tie those things together, you have to either manually put some sort of a metadata on there or a header or an ID or something to track across all these requests, um, or you can use a library like Zipkin, which will automatically integrate and like, intercept and put that data on there for you, and then you don't have to worry about managing it. So then when messages go across Kafka or Rabbit or HTTP, or REST or whatever, they get like packaged with this like Zipkin integration, and, uh, and there's some logging you'll see what it looks like when I run the thing. That allows it to like trace those requests across the infrastructure. Uh, specifically when you're doing microservices, it's very important to have that traceability. Now, we've, we've run... We, we actually currently don't use Zipkin just because we haven't integrated it, and this is my first integration uh, of it with these sample projects. So in some ways, I can't say that it's a great thing or not a great thing, but I know that the, uh, the idea behind the thing is very powerful. So, uh, And then I, I did include, include in that project, there's a Docker Compose file with, that'll boot up the entire uh, uh, infrastructure and allow you to just run it locally uh, in, one, in one big Docker container. So. So why Grails? I'm just going to cover this quickly because I think we all were here, um, most of us. Any, any, anybody here not use Grails in some way or shape or form today? So yeah, I think we're uh, a couple. So for, for the most part, at least you're here, we understand why Grails is pretty, pretty cool, the, the, the uh, usability of it. Super low barrier to entry. Uh, we have React Reactor now built in, which is really great. We talk about that internal messaging, which is a very uh, le legitimate application architecture, if you want to do internal events to your system, if you just have one, if you're doing a small application and it's just it's isolated and you want to do internal events, even many of these things together, you know, if you have three or four servers, internal eventing can still be very powerful because maybe you just care about communicating to the JVM that something happened that it just needs to do its own thing and you don't care that it, it scales across different servers, it's just you want to do it asynchronously or you want to do it in an event pattern that doesn't block your normal stuff from happening, which is really great, and that support is built into Grail, so it makes doing uh, internal eventing pretty much just like, like a, a no-brainer, super easy. Um, Multi-threading code in Grails is really rather enjoyable. We do a lot of uh, tasks and async-driven code in our Grails application, um, and if you haven't looked at the docs on that, I think I linked the docs in here, it's, it's really easy. You just, you statically import the promises task method, and you can just say tasks do a thing, and it's just going to wired up with the promise and it's going to do all the stuff it needs to do and you can just you know call a git on block on it or you can wait for all and you can just do these asynchronous tasks super easily and just with very minimal uh, ceremony at all so we've we've took to taken full advantage of all the grails constructs for doing async uh, stuff here as well um, grails is suited to both monoliths and microservices um, our current application is a is a very large application a very large e-commerce application finger you can go there right now and you look it's very it's, you know, it's many thousands of classes and four or five layers deep of, of plug-in architecture. It's pretty complex. It's a big monolith. And we also have microservices that we've written uh, in Grails. We also uh, have a lot of microservices built in Spring Boot, which is also plays well into the Grails uh, infrastructure because uh, in the e ecosystem because since Grails is built on Spring Boot, all the things we write for our Spring Boot clients, we can just use in our Grails application. So it's... Works really great. Uh, as Graham, uh, for those that were here at the keynote, when Graham demoed the, uh, the API, the REST API profile, I have found in using that that statically compiled JSON views are wicked fast. I mean, super fast. So fast that like our backend systems are just are the slope, are the, the bottleneck now. So building those those uh, REST APIs and JSON with statically compiled views is is very pleasant. Uh, once you figure out how the, the JSON view language works and the template structure works, it becomes a very enjoyable experience to build those things. It's when, you know, having those JSON views is way easier to create uh, your own customized material views of what you want to show in JSON versus having to create a bunch of marshallers and all register these marshaller beans and stuff. And I, I just never was a fan of that. And the REST API profile it does that uh, pretty well for you. Uh, again, it's built on Spring Boot. So Spring Boot is great for everything. There's Spring Boot starters for almost every project and that you could want to use for Kafka, for Rabbit. There's all these starter projects out there for that stuff. Uh, it's a plugin architecture. We take full advantage of that. We have a lot of we have a domain plugin that's our domain stuff. We have a, a web plugin that's all of our web stuff. We have a like our UI web uh, actual site plug uh, t uh, sites. Everything just inherits from these plugins, and it's really really easy to track that. Other projects can share the plugins. Um, they can be rich plugins more so than some other frameworks, which I think is really great. So I don't need to sell you guys on Grails. You guys probably use Grails already. So uh, there's alternatives, of course, and I would be remiss if I didn't 
put Rat Pack up there because I'm a fan. And um, if you went to the talks today, hopefully you were like, oh, cool, I like, I like that. I'll try that stuff out. Uh, seeing the, even just earlier uh, the talk, we had a, a rabbit example in Rat Pack, and it was seemed pretty easy. And I'm sure the Kafka one is also very easy. So if you're interested in doing some of this work in Rat Pack or you're in Rat Pack, I think everything that works here is also applicable in the Rat Pack infrastructure. So don't think this is just a Grails or a Spring Boot specific stuff. Um, and by Dan's book, so there you go. So here's the reactive manifesto. This is uh, that's the URL there. You can go to. You can we can read their ever evolving manifesto. Essentially, it says that every system should be responsive, resilient, message driven, and elastic. Seems pretty simple, right? Sounds reasonable. Um, what these actually mean, and I I have the definitions in my notes, but um, to be responsive meaning that I should always respond to you in some capacity, right? Systems that just hang or don't do a thing are not good because then we end up leaving other systems or clients just unexpected of what's happening. Like, why is it spinning? Why is it not responding? What's going on? So your system should also should always be able to respond in some, whether it's a, a <coughs> failure or a success condition, it should always respond. It should be responsive. It should, be, uh, it should work. Uh, resilient, it should stay up, right? Your system should stay up under under load, right? That's that's kind of the definition of being resilient. So as the load increases, your system should be able to adapt and or if it can't scale, it should at least be able to gracefully degrade itself to stay up under under load. So it should be resilient. Uh, it should use message-driven pattern for communicating. That means that you should essentially adopt the message-driven ar uh, architecture to use this because that can keep you up and more usable for your clients, uh, specifically around, you communicate through asynchronous channels and that's gonna be a lot better because then you can stack up those, those calls somewhere else, not on your system, not in your, on your JVM, so they're not waiting in your JVM to do stuff. And it should be elastic, meaning that it should, you know, it should scale under load, essentially, or kind of like be able to adjust. And I think that one's a little different than resilient. I can't remember the exact definition on that one, but. Um, so here's the, this funny thing that I, I found. It was message-driven and event-driven. This is the definition of a, of a the Wikipedia, somebody said event driven, also known as message driven. But then if you Google it, it's like, oh, they're not the same thing. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I think what people try to harp home is that message driven, specifically as it relates to the reactive manifesto, means that a message can contain an event, all right? So a message is a bundle of a thing that can have an event in it. I don't know. I guess that makes sense, but essentially, like an event as an abstraction isn't isn't a message. It's just a it's just a thing that happened, and the message is the thing that carries the thing that happened somewhere. Okay, whatever. So that's how you meet the message-driven portion of that. Uh, resilient, responsive, and elastic. Just use Hysterix. <laughs> You're it's solved. I mean, it's not 100% solved, but if you haven't used Hysterix, look at it. Uh, watch my talk that I just gave. I talked about Hysterix particularly. That can that can help bring you a long way in into those three areas of the uh, reactive manifesto. So again, two main approaches: internal through reactor and external system messaging. So let's real quickly. Internal eventing is just this. We've got our app our application. We do some we enqueue some message internally. It just processes the thing. Let's say, for example, we say, hey, I got a user, I want to save it. And I'll just tell the user, I'm going to save your user. Okay, so then it sends a message, save the user, and it says, oh, hey, I'm going to asynchronously save this guy. Saves into MySQL, for example. Um, and this is some real simple code on how to make these things work. Uh, this is, I think, right off the documentation from the Grails async. So I did not write this. However, this just use the notify event, which is the events trait that comes on all services and controllers, you just say fire off to some some top some mess topic space, some namespace, some data. And as long as your service is annotated with the consumer at consumer and you have a selector on there, um, you can consume the event. I don't, I don't know if the, the dot. I thought it was uh, that was there. You could do a dot in there. Do you know, Colin? I'm assuming that the the, the namespaces should match. I don't know why they don't match in this one, but. They should match here. Um, fix your docs. No, I'm just um, I don't know. And then you 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 can you, you can respond to that to that event, and you can uh, then the object gets passed in. The, the The limitation that I found to this particular pattern, um, something to note, is that the 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 selector, the at selector, and the event can only respond to a single data object. Okay, that meaning that 
if I fire a string, or if I want, hey, if I want to, if I want to say this person got changed and and this other thing happened, let's say like I want to know the the context of the person and the order, right? This person was created and this order was created. I have to create a an object that's going to basically shuttle those in as one object. So I got to create like a DTL. It's going to have a person and an, or an order on there, and then shuttle that in as one one object. So you can't pass in multiple parameters. It doesn't understand. Today, at least, doesn't understand the concept of like uh, an object uh, array arg. It just, just it won't work. So you gotta you gotta bundle your data as one thing. You know, probably as JSON, maybe as a list, maybe as a map, whatever. They just take an object. You you're gonna have, you're gonna have to you can def it if you want, um, or you're gonna have to like essentially interpret that object type. You can you can you can type it for sure if you if you had a DTL like my order person DTL. You could type it in there. It would take it in and hopefully it should should all marshal just fine. Um, and then you could do some stuff upon that thing. So fire an event. This thing will asynchronously re respond. So like the event could be received and processed before the next thing actually happens. So you got to keep that in mind too with these systems. Like don't be dependent on that thing for this to happen next because that's not a message-driven system. That's going to be a synchronous system. And you, you want a blocking call for there. So if I need to get a confirmation number before I can return back a response to the client, Mm, that's gonna, not going to work. So, you know, but I'm sure if you, if you stew on it, even right now, you can probably think in your own system, like how I could, you know, hey, I sent an email to the person when they register, when they sign on to the site. Oh, I don't need to do that. I don't need to send an email in a blocking call and, like, have the email system, like, pork my whole entire registration flow because it didn't respond. I can just send an email, uh, move along, say, thanks for, we got your thing, and then they send the email, you know, on an on a internal event. And that's a great use of like an internal event. Like I can have my own server respond back to that particular event that happened. I don't need to have some other system or some other thing respond. I could, if I've already built the mail service and I've already built the registration event, I've already, I've already got this pattern. I just need to like put in the notify and the, and the selector there. So pretty easy to do that. Um, I'll just quickly cover this list. Sorry, the red's kind of hard to read, but I kind of tried to color code them. Like I think that this internal venting is great for small applications. You just know external dependencies. Uh, it's good for large applications when you have isolated events inside the system that you don't need to parallelize or distribute across the systems. Um, there's built-in GORM events. So in the documentation, you can go look and you can see that when GORM happens in your application, it emits certain events like on save, on validate, on, on persist. All these events get emitted by GORM and like you just probably haven't listened to them or have consumed them and that's... That can be powerful because when a user is updated, let's say I can look at that, you know, it'll admit event with that data and say like, hey, a user was updated or updated object and get the object and you can say, well, if it's type user and the name is John and they're now, they're, they got a new birthday, I can send them a birthday card and what, I mean, whatever, you can just make up your own scenarios. But GORM will just, is just emitting events right now and just no one's listening to them. So in time to your Grail 3 application, GORM is constantly just emitting events that nothing is getting consumed or listening to, but they're there and if you want to use them, that's great for when you get, uh, uh, get hooked into GORM. Uh, and then it's a pretty easy transition uh, to asynchronous code. So if you want to do asynchronous stuff and you want to have message driven, like the internal events make it pretty easy and it's a pretty low barrier of cost mentally and, and physical hardware to actually do this because you don't have to get anything new. You just like use the things that are already there. So that, I think that's pretty good. Um, there is scalability concerns via coupling. I kind of mentioned this, that if you have a distributed system like we have, let's say in our production environment, we have eight web servers, right? Well, if one server just happens to be weirdly load balanced, so it's taking a bunch of requests, and he's like firing events, and then he's got to respond to those events. He's trying to like take taking calls, and he's also trying to service these asynchronous things that are happening. And you know, if he's firing too many events and receiving too many requests, he can kind of like bog himself down and get a little bit over over overburdened um, in general. So you're not you're not saying like, hey, here's an event, and then anybody can do it. You're just saying like, I got to do this thing now. So like. Yeah, it's on. A, it's in a different thread. It's on. It's asynchronous, but it could still cause the system to become a. You know, on scale, it could cause the system to become a little bit unstable. So that's something I think about. Um, one thing that bit me in the butt was that GORM events via Hibernate can fire multiple times. And I actually submitted an issue to Grail's core and said, "Hey, by the way, I was looking at the GORM uh, whatever event, and it it fired twice. And once it was firing Hibernate, and once it was firing at GORM, and like oh, the Hibernate thing caused the thing." And Graham was like, oh, yeah, it sucks, mate. I'm like, oh, okay. So 
like he's like, well, you got to just know it's going to fire twice. And I said, okay, I guess I'm not going to fix it. So just keep in mind that certain certain events, because of how Hibernate is hooked up, can happen like more than one time. So what's it? Yeah, right. So it's not like it's a it's bad coding. It's just the way the way Hibernate is wired up and works. And I'm not a, I'm not an OCI, OCI guy. I don't quite understand that stuff, but. I know it can happen multiple times. I did see where it was happening twice in a particular case where I was looking at it. So, um, and what I mean about that last one there is that, you know, if you emit the event, you're processing the event. That's pretty much kind of back to the scalability concern. Like, you you have to know, essentially, if if you're building these things in your system, if I say I'm going to fire a user whatever event, like, well, I since I built the user event, I know I have to consume the user event. Therefore, like I'm I'm personally coupled, or my system, or my team of people are personally coupled to this event, and that's it. That's it. That's, that's the visibility of that event, right? So, like, it's internal, and you better hope that if you're doing asynchronous programming, even for internal or external, I talk about this with the external messaging too. You got to know what events you're emitting and what events you're consuming because you don't want somebody else later in a different service to like start emitting the same type of thing, and but it's you know responding differently because the names are different on your on event space, right? So. You have to you have to somehow keep track of the events that you're firing and that you're consuming, and you can do that through patterns in your code by keeping all your code in one spot. For you know, you, Grails makes it really easy to just like litter that con at consumer at all your services, and then you have like no real pattern of like who's consuming things and who's emitting things because like anybody can consume, anybody can 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 uh, uh, emit things, and then you kind of have you start losing context if you have a big application, especially a monolith where. We've got a checkout team, and we've got a shop team, and we've got a, a web a my account team, and you know maybe the shop team cares about a message that we're doing, or vice versa. But unless you like collaborate, or they're looking at your code, they would never know that you're doing this type of stuff. So if you if you wrote it, you're probably the one that's using it. Therefore, you're you know you got to make sure that you're disseminating that information about amongst your team, and it becomes even harder with distributed systems. And I'll, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, complexity. So. There, it's just it can be it can be a little complex because of, ooh, ooh. the problem with using Google Slides um, complexity and the scalability for module applications meaning that when you have libraries and plugins like how do you know what things they're doing they're emitting events you're not emitting events I don't know like you better have documentation around if you're using even self-provided plugins like what events are you emitting what events are you consuming. Right? And this is a this is a overly simplified version of uh, distributed topics. Um, anybody use MQ in their in their in their life? Yeah, most people. Anybody have an ESB still at their company? ESB enterprise service buses? No. Okay, good. Um, so your growth application will just enqueue something remotely. I put Kafka. Could be Rabbit. Could be something else. Um, and the beauty about distributed systems is that this doesn't have to be a growth application. This can be whatever. It's just some other system. Other system can listen for that event on that or on that topic, can listen to the, something that happened, and can do some work. That might be another application in your application cluster. That might be, you know, you got two web apps. One submits an event, and this one is gee, his little re, little little reactor, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the the event bus is not. He's not busy, and he goes, "Hey, I got an event. I'll do the work." Okay, he does the work, and this guy can keep doing other stuff, right? That's great. Or it can be some other system like, hey, we're on the web, we submit an order, and the Kafka goes. The order processing services that we build now can can just basically listen for be listening for events like, hey, I'm waiting for orders, I'm waiting for orders. And one comes in, it goes, oh, I'm plucking them off. If there's a flood of orders on the website, and this guy, for you know, that one guy on your team, Tom, who's a terrible developer, wrote this thing and it's super slow, you don't care because he's just going to be like, oh, order is cool, and you're like, orders, and you're firing him out there. And he, you know, he doesn't have to go fast. He, he can go relatively s slower than you because you're not going to probably fire in, you know, a load onto him consistently over a long period of time. But it'll it'll keep the rate at which he's processing orders consistent, and it won't slow your system down because he's slow, right? The, or the, the the system behind you is slow. So that's really the beauty of distributed systems. And if you haven't, um, if you don't have those in your system today, it's it's kind of why why we went there because we've we don't control a lot of the back end processes that are behind us and you know the the level of the teams varies right so we got some teams that are super senior some teams that are not student senior some that are new to Java because we're like hey we're Java and they're .NET people and they're like oh so you know it, it helps op, like shed some of the system load by having this hugely scalable events uh, 
topic system there that you can put stuff into. Uh, and this is just a real quick snippet on how to submit. Uh, once you have things wired up, mind you, there's some, there's some wiring behind this stuff we'll look at. Um, to push stuff into uh, a topic, we have, we have a producer bean that basically gets wired up. I, have a, I send some record, some stuff in there. Um, and this, this, this is doing an asynchronous send here, so it just sends off some data with some, or some, some record with some metadata on it, right? Mm -hmm. Off it goes. On the, on the other system or somewhere else, there's something wired up that's gonna be in this run, which because when you consume Kafka, that it's basically just an executor thread that just kind of keeps running like this and on a loop and just looks for messages. It's gonna find messages and it's going to grab the message out of there. In this case, I'm just parsing to a new person domain object in my example code and I just log it out to the system. But I could do whatever I want at that point. And these, these two pieces of code are in different, different systems, right? They're in different applications. So this is in one application, this is in the, the producer, and this is in the consumer application. So one's producing, one's consuming. So it's not the actual implementation of the code once you have like the boilerplate wiring stuff on there is not a lot to do this type of activity. It's just to get the beans wired and get Kafka set up and get Rabbit set up, there's a little bit of code in there. Uh, so why, why is this good? Why would I use this stuff? You know, I think to counter the point of why I wouldn't use the internal stuff, um, good stuff, we'll skip over that. DevOps has got another layer to manage. We, we've got a DevOps team, they're great, but now we've got Kafka and constantly we're like, hey, someone created a bad topic and you know they've got their replication level set wrong and uh, can you fix that? Because we don't have admin rights in there and then the system comes down and so DevOps is like, ah, I want more thing to manage. Uh, not, not really my problem, but it's also ultimately the organization's problem. So it's something, you know, you're, you're putting more onus on people in the org to manage that technology. Now Kafka is pretty reliable, doesn't go down all that, all that often, but it can happen. Um, not every operation is easily message driven. This is probably could be true of both approaches. Um, for example, I probably, could I log in asynchronously? I probably not. <laughs> could I, I don't know, could I do a banking transaction asynchronously? Like, hey, deposit money, like, okay, <laughs> sure, I'll do that later. And probably not, like, so some things you probably can't async and you can't make message driven. However, the transactional piece could be synchronous, right? So like deposit transaction happens, boom, it comes back and says, hey, I deposited that thing that was transactional, completed across whatever. I could then fire an event said like, hey, by the way, I made this deposit. If anybody cares about that, go ahead and do something about it, right? So then I could, have a system that could be like, oh, hey, I s Christian deposited a, heck, a lot of money. Hey, I'm gonna send you an offer for a gift card for whatever. And so, like, the, your, your your bank could essentially like be offering you incentives on your deposits via asynchronously, right? Something that could be totally feasible. Uh, but not everything should be moved asynchronously, especially like transact, like specifically distributed transactions that shouldn't be put into this space uh, at all. Um, so this this is kind of similar to what I mean about you, you eat your dog food that when you when you build the system and you build the events, if you're the emitter of an event, you gotta tell people you're emitting the event. Otherwise, they won't know to consume it, right? Of course, you might have a handshake deal with some other team, like, hey, we're gonna emit that event, and they're like, cool, we'll, we'll consume that thing. And then somebody else comes in and says, like, man, it'd be really cool if I had this stuff, and, well, okay, yeah, well, well we do. Oh, cool, all right. So you, you gotta be able to disseminate the information across your organization in a way that makes sense, and it could be a wiki, it could be you know, ASCII docs, it could be your internal documentation for your application, it could be some other mechanism that you choose or however you do that, but try to make sure that when you're doing this stuff, you put the information that you're publishing, both in maybe a schema or uh, the, the, just the names of the topics at least somewhere. Uh, and I think what that last one covers is schema here. So like deciding on an enterprise level schema for distributed messaging, that's really hard. Like you can just say JSON, okay, it's JSON. Okay, well, what does the person what does the person JSON look like? Mm, I don't know. Well, here let me let me give you a library that's a person JSON. You can use that. Well, now you're coupling the systems together in a way that like, well, I can't change my person. I got to republish my client library so they can consume the person to marshal it. And or do you not get you just say like, well, here's the spec, and then they build their own person object, and then they got to like, there's still this transformation has to happen, and you're not sharing code. And when the five systems use the same person DTO, then everybody's like, what the heck are we doing? Like we're just doing the same marshaling five times and. If you haven't gone through this exercise with microservices, you will because there's two camps. There's the, we're gonna make a client library and you're gonna call us through the client library and we'll give you DTOs or there's the camp that says like, nope, right, it's gonna be a JSON spec and you're just gonna like build your own objects. 
and you're, you're going to fight. I don't have the right answer. I just, uh, we've gone through that battle, and it's, it's been kind of hard. Um, and event failure. So when a, when a distributed event fails, or even an event for that matter, it's really hard to tell the user uh, on a system unless you have a mechanism in which you can say, like, an, like something, a notification on the site that says, like, oh, by the way, hey, we tried to do that thing. We couldn't do it. I don't know, it's in their, their My Account area. For it's not, it's shows up with a banner. You kind of got to get creative with, like, if something is important but needs to be communicated to the user, it can happen via an email to them, like, we tried to do the thing. We couldn't do it. Here's the notification. But ultimately, f communication failure is really hard. Um, Spring Cloud. So that last slide that I uh, showed about the how we do uh, communication via distributed systems, this is basically the same code with Spring Cloud. So it, all it is is you just basically say that, hey, I've got some source. It's going to go to some output. Send off a message. Here we go. We're done. That's it. That's it. It's super simple. I don't have to wire up Kafka, and I'll show you that code in here. So I'm going to demo some of that stuff. Let's, let's actually look at code, and we'll, we'll look at what the systems look like running. I think that'll be... So in this project here, I've got three sample projects. We've got a consumer, uh, a producer, and then a stream producer. I've got all these running inside of uh, Docker right now. Um, and real simply, I'm just going to fire off uh, a create person event into the, pro the, the, the producer. Is the green OK? I'm going to fire off an uh, a REST call to a Grails controller that says, like, hey, I'm going to post some person data into this controller, and I'll show you the controller. And these are these other three windows around the, around the screen here are this. One is the stream consumer, one is the uh, producer, and one's the consumer. So when I fire this off, you know, we saw some console lines go by. Pretty cool, right? Okay, fantastic. So that we got that to work. So, essentially, what's happening? Um, we'll start here at the. By the way, for those of you that are interested in Zipkin, this is what the Zipkin message format looks like here. That blue, ah, that green is awful. I wish I wouldn't have picked green. It's easy to see on my screen anyway. Doesn't recorrect, doesn't provide. Anyway, Zipkin format is, it gives some kind of a, a trace ID here. So this is what's really important with, with Zipkin, is that the trace ID comes in. We've got a trace ID. Um, this is essentially kind of like a sh sh shortened GUID. It's like a, it's like a uh, how many digit long that thing is? 12, 12 digit long hash. That should, it's guaranteed to be relatively unique over a certain time period, right? Because there's quite a few of those available. So. That allows us to get this traceability. You'll see that they put on there a parent ID. Um, and this is just, if you install Zipkin, it just natively like instruments your HTTP calls. It does a bunch of stuff on your HTTP calls. So um, ultimately, that, that happens. Uh, we got, um, you know, I sent a message off into Kafka. This thing received a Kafka. This Kafka event consumer happened and got that thing. Um, I think this thing stopped working. So there's that. Uh, let's go look at the code real quick. So here's the person service that we, or the person controller we just called. Right? Pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. He's just a RESTful controller. Um, he now, when I created a person, he there's there's two methods. I have this one commented out right now. Uh, there's some there's some I somehow introduced a bug where the internal reactor events create a threading problem. I think it has to do with the way Zipkin's working. I don't know. So I'm trying to figure that one out. But this this emitted across uh, here to to both Kafka and to Rabbit. Uh, sent a message to this guy. Sent a message to that guy. And off into the world they went, and that was it. That's all I had to do. I didn't, you know, that's essentially the, these are somewhat, if we look at these guys here, to get to get Kafka hooked up, there's some, some code here where you have to 
initialize some properties for your Kafka, tell it like, hey, um, this is how I serialize my objects across the wire. This, this goes back into how you pick your message uh, standards. So I just have a string serializer. I'm just sending a string across, which is just JSON. So I've, I've already turned it into a string, and it's just a string deserializer. So it, I, don't have, I don't do any marshaling on the wire. I just do it when I get it back. Uh, you set some properties. I just set how many retries it should do and how long it should like linger around and like wait. Uh, create the bean here, essentially, uh, in the class. Send sync, send async. So you, you can either send a record into Kafka synchronously or asynchronously. Just meaning that if I send it synchronously, I'm going to like send the message. I'm going to wait till I get a response back from Kafka and says like, okay, got it. I can send asynchronously, meaning that I'm going to send a message into this into Kafka, and I don't care what the response is. I'm just going to set up a callback, and when when the thing happens, I'm going to say that just you know I, I, I can re respond or react to that callback asynchronously into that send there, that producer send. So I've got some stuff here that just logs out some inputs. It's like, hey, I got I got. I finally put the record in, into Kafka, got that back. Uh, conversely, the Rabbit implementation of that is very similar. Yeah, so I'm not even like, Rabbit template is just a, a class that comes from um, their, their core spring Rabbit library. You just have to wire it up with some stuff, I think, uh, for the yeah, I don't. Mm, it's been a while since I wrote this. I don't think I even do any uh, specific implementation besides just set some properties on that thing. Yeah. So I am just creating a bean in Spring here, Rabbit template. Return back a new template with just create a connection factory. And connection factory just has some properties in there, like a host, a host IP, that kind of stuff. I create some queues to exchange some stuff on, um, and that's pretty standard queue uh, boilerplate stuff. Then I can send stuff into a queue, uh, particularly here I've got a person created, person deleted queues I'm creating. Um, Rabbit's a little more flexible in that, in, that's in that capacity that I can have like really nice namespaces to my topics where I can, uh, Kafka also works the same way a little bit, but Rabbit I found has better namespacing for the topics. You can have like person.saved, person.created, you know, person dot whatever, and those can be topic names. And to me, that makes more sense of events, so you can have like a, a very specific uh, uh, canonical namespace for all of your topics that you're talking to, uh, particularly around like how you communicate, like person dot save is a pretty, it's known that, okay, that all the saves are gonna go into there, for example. Um, but ultimately, the wiring for this, this is just, again, this is just kind of boilerplate stuff. Uh, really, the only thing that is wiring up this bean is just this rabbit template line right here. So. To, to get these pieces running your code, it's it, you know it's not a lot of work to get to make that happen. I'm just using a standard import here and configurations, Kafka configuration. This just creates some, a new producer. Uh, the one thing about Kafka is that it it runs uh, on the, on the other side. It runs as like a the, the listener. the Kafka config, essentially what it's doing is that you just create this uh, class, that ex this uh, service that has a run in there. Um, it's going to essentially loop, just loop over and over and over again. Um, and it creates an instance of this, of this runnable. The runnable is just going to basically be running in the background constantly, just running, 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 looking for messages on, on, a, on, on the Kafka topic, essentially. And it just runs and runs and runs forever until you shut your application down. So that's Pretty, pretty painless to get that working. Again, I've got all this code here. I don't want to go line by line. If you want, if you're interested in using it, feel free to, you know, steal as much as you want of this stuff to get it working. Um, let's look at the streams real quick. So in the streams, so you can see there's, there's 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 actually you know, it's not insignificant, but it's not a significant amount of code to make this stuff work. I've got to at least put some properties in the scope. I got to create some beans. I got to tell it what topics I need to name, all this stuff. When I go to the stream producer, if you want to start using that kind of uh, stuff, that's pretty much it. <laughs> so I'm going to create this 
interface, person channel, that says, hey, I'm going to output to this Kafka, this Kafka save Kafka. And all I gotta say, because it's all done through configuration, I'll show you the config real quick. You just say send, send a message. I'm just building up, just having their, they, they have a, they're on a opinionated way to build messages and build a payload. So it's just this one line, like my channel, my interface, call the method, just call Kafka save. I just called the Kafka save because I had a rabbit and a Kafka one in there. I just wanted to show that, you know, you can do them differently. And then send, off it goes. All the configuration is done. Here, this is this is it right here. So as long as inside your YAML you've got this uh, this piece of information or in your config, you tell it Spring Cloud Stream. Uh, the default binder for doing stuff is this person one. I just commented the rabbit stuff out because I only need to show one at a time because they both work the same way. I'm saying listen uh, to this Zookeeper instance and use this Kafka IP address. So that means that when I send a message through the Cloud Stream. Uh, and the person Kafka uh, binder, it's going to like be a type Kafka and use those IP addresses, and it's just the way it goes. So by default, all I have to do is just create some configuration. I can have multiple binders with the stream stuff, and just send them off into the stream, and then they, through configuration magic, hook up to the right endpoint provider. And that's, I was like, well, okay, I should have thought about that before I wrote both of those other slides. But this this makes it a lot easier, and the barrier ent entry is a lot lower to get into writing to a rabbit or a Kafka. So if you're interested in doing it, look into the, 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 the clouds, the cloud, uh, spring cloud stream stuff. Um, that's kind of the end of the time. So anybody any have any questions? I know it's, a lot, it's like a lot of stuff that it sounds like nobody's really doing. So questions on that stuff? Okay, so the question was, are there advantages or disadvantages for using Kafka over Rabbit? Um, yeah, so it, it kind of personal preference, right? So like Rabbit, from an operation standpoint, I think, I feel, not being a DevOps guy, it's easier to manage. It's, it's been around a longer, the pattern's more known. There's better user interfaces for the admin of Rabbit. So if you have a Rabbit server running, you can have like a nice web interface to get into the topics and do the stuff. There are some open source projects to get into Kafka to view the, the topics that are in there, but they're still kind of a work in progress and they're not, I don't think they're officially uh, supported or sponsored by the Apache Kafka project. They're kind of like somebody wrote a UI that you can kind of use. Um, so from that regard, you know, Rabbit has probably been around longer. It's specifically tailored to just doing topics and queues. It's from Rabbit MQ, it's a message queue system. Um, the advantage to Kafka is it, as far as I, I have seen any white papers written, will scale beyond what Rabbit's capability are, it is today. So Kafka is designed to be a distributed messaging system, meaning that like by out of the gate, it runs in a cluster of servers and it can scale widely. And like it, it shards data, it does all this stuff, the, the log is, <laughs> very fast and very efficient. It's specifically designed for do, it's, since, it, since it's a little different, and I don't know how Rabbit works on the coverage, but since Kafka is, is actually a log, so like it, it just literally just like sticks these records in this log space in a time sequence. It does that very fast and very well. Um, it, that, and that technology premise, and I'm not a technologist in, in the sense of like knowing those technologies, is, is very capable in keeping track of events because you don't, you don't have to worry about ordering or sequencing or anything. It just throws them in there and, and, and just one after another, just pens them in this way. And then when, when you use a system, what's nice about Kafka is that it uses Zookeeper to keep track of all of the offsets for consumer groups. I don't know how Rabbit does the same thing, but with Kafka, when I have a consumer group of servers, like I, I have servers one, two, and three that are all in one group, like, hey, I'm, I'm consuming order messages, right? So these three servers are consuming order messages. What will happen is that one one will go in and say, like, give me the next thing on the topic, right? And, and you're like, okay, well, it's, you, you your group is at message number 12, right? Okay, pull it down. Then the next server goes, give me the next message. Okay, you're at 13 now. It, like, it has this this tracking of where it is in the process of, of processing the topic. Whereas I think in, and what and what what you can do because it's a log, is that if your if your consumer group gets kind of a haywire and something like goes wrong and it 
like somebody forgot to put the dot save method at the end. So like it, you, you consumed all the messages, right? Up and, and, and up, out they came. And then you go, oh my God, we didn't do the transform or we didn't save the thing. All you have to do is just say like, hey, set this consumer group's offset back to 12. Deploy your code back out, run it again. It'll pick up from message 12 in Kafka and start running that whole thing. So, so you have replayability in Kafka. In Rabbit, I'm pretty sure since it's a topic, now you, you, can, you can have, I don't know how you replay topics. I'm, somebody who's rab more into Rabbit can, can school me on this, but my understanding is that once, you, once your application kind of consumes those things across the topic, you have to kind of like start, either start over. I don't know if you can pick a restarting point inside of the topic and say like, oh no, 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 start at message 55 and start playing again. I don't know if Rabbit works the same way. I don't think it does. I think like you either, you, you've either marked the message consumed or it's not consumed. I, yeah, well, it, well, for a topic, it wouldn't be gone because you might have multiple subscribers to a topic. Like, your, your, your ability to process it has been marked, right? Like, I've marked that I process that message now with, with Rabbit. In, in, a, in a queue, it would be gone, but I think in a topic, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be persisted. But the fact that I've processed all those messages now has basically been, been checked. Yeah, I processed those messages. So if I want to process I've got to, like, start over again. Like, I don't think you can, like, resume from a point. Whereas Kafka, you can always replay from any point in the log that has still persisted. So in Kafka, you still have to be smart to say like, well, we're gathering terabytes of data per day. I can't just like perpetually gather more and more data. At some point you have to like either roll it off somewhere or you have to just trunk it, right? You have to trunk the log. So, um, but Kafka, because it's distributed, can scale a lot larger because you've got more systems of capacity to grow, you know, uh, and scale out. So you can, you know, terabytes of data would would be okay in Kafka. You know, I don't think terabytes of data in Rabbit would be good. So there, there, there's that. So the scale of the things are different. So I think that. So I think for us, the the the, the replayability was was really key because you can always replay data. You can always be like, oh crap, I need to. I can pull data out of production too and put it into a different uh, different Kafka, and like I can replay those events in a non-production environment to see what happened. Like, oh, why why did this fail? I'm going to replay them. Oh, it failed because this message was a poison message and stopped the whole thing. Right? I can. I can pull a date out and replay it. Um, so yeah, good, good question. Anything else? There's got to be questions. Nobody's doing this stuff. Anybody have any? Yep. So we are not personally doing that. However, the 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 if you read the documentation for Zipkin, the intent for Zipkin is that it's supposed to have, if you use the Kafka libraries and you use the RabbitMQ libraries and you use HTTP, you know, uh, clients, Zipkin is supposed to just like live on top, like you're supposed to just automatically instrument in top of, on top of those things and put the Zipkin data, the metadata into the messages. So we are not, but I, I, it's, I think as long as you have Zipkin in there and you have it on the same class path as your Kafka stuff, I think it should just work, right? So it should just keep that metadata across that stuff. Again, we're, we're, not, act we're not actively doing that. We're trying to get to that point. Uh, but yeah, so that our goal is soon to do that. But yes, I think that's, that, that was the intent of Zipkin was to get it, to keep the messages organized so we can see the path as they flow through the system, especially because the, the messages are going to come out of, out of Kafka into these other systems and they're being processed by three or four different people, you know, in different times. So we want to see like, well, it failed in this system later th or earlier than it did in this system, you know, and we can try and track down what, 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 what was the process of flow that happened, right? No, no questions, Devendra? Okay. All right, guys, thank you.